In Korea, United Nations troops push on in the cautious advance against the communists. An advance whose purpose General Ridgway states... Welcome back guys to Information Center. Today we are delving into a crucial topic that resonates through history and shapes our world. Termination of war in international law. And you know guys, understanding how conflicts are legally resolved is vital for promoting peace and stability. But before we dive in guys, kindly take you a few seconds, just hit the subscribe button and put on notification bell so that YouTube will automatically notify you when we upload a new video. The only way you can support me guys, it is through your subscription. And without wasting much time, let us get started. <music> Guys, before I dive into the methods and intricacies, let me define what I mean by the termination of war in international law. It is the process of legally ending hostilities between nations or parties involved in a conflict. Throughout history, nations have sought to end wars through established legal frameworks. These frameworks have evolved over time, reflecting changing attitudes towards conflict resolution. In Korea, United Nations troops push on in the cautious advance against the communists. An advance whose purpose, General Ridgway states, is not to seize ground but to wipe out the enemy. The Chinese Red Army, fighting desperately in small isolated stands, prefers to give ground on wider fronts rather than join battle. And it's up to the infantry to clear out the pockets of die-hard communists. Let us talk about the methods of war terminations. When it comes to ending wars, different methods are employed based on the context and the parties involved. Treaties, amnesties, and ceasefires are some of the common methods. Take the Treaty of Versailles after World War I or the Korean Amnesties Agreement that halted the Korean War. These guys are the examples of how legal agreements have been used to put an end to hostilities. It was the longest negotiated armistice in history. On July 27, 1953, military leaders from North Korea and China and the U.S.-led United Nations Command, the fighting parties in the three-year Korean War, met at Panmunjom as they finally agreed to a ceasefire deal. A military armistice commission was set up to negotiate and implement the terms of the agreement. International organizations like United Nations play a pivotal role in mediating negotiations and ensuring compliance with agreement. Mr. President, Most Reverend Archbishop of Canterbury, distinguished members of the Security Council, war is becoming increasingly complex, and so is mediating peace. Today, internal conflicts frequently take on regional and transnational dimensions. Many feature a deadly mix of fragmented armed groups and political interests funded by criminal activities. Conflicts around the world drag on for years and decades, holding back development and stunting opportunities. And comprehensive peace agreements are becoming more elusive and short-lived. Political will wanes, international attention drifts. The Central African Republic, for example, has suffered overlapping national and local conflicts for decades. Yet some 15 peace agreements have been signed there since 1997. As bad as the situation is in many parts of the world, I'm convinced that it is within our power to tackle and reverse these trends. <coughs> and this is why, since the beginning of my tenure, one of my key priorities has been a surge in diplomacy for peace. And as I have consistently stressed, we must make prevention our priority. Their involvement helps prevent conflicts from reigniting and paves the way for a lasting peace. War termination, guys, isn't just about signing documents. It's about upholding legal principles. Jews at Belum and the Jews in Belo are two important aspects. When trying to understand the laws that regulate armed conflicts, we often encounter two terms that tower over the subject. Use ad bellum and use in bello. Use ad bellum, Latin for the law on going to war, refers to the conditions under which states may resort to the use of force. Use in bello, Latin for the law in war, refers to the norms governing behavior in armed conflicts while they are actually happening. So while both use ad bellum and use in bello deal with matters linked to armed conflict, they refer to different branches of law. 
Jus ad bellum is another term for the international law regulating the resort to force by states. This law determines whether such use of force is legal or not. Article 2, Section 4 of the United Nations Charter states, All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Exceptions to this prohibition are self-defense and authorization by the UN Security Council. Use in bello is another term for international humanitarian law, IHL. IHL does not rule on whether an armed conflict is legal or not. That is not relevant for IHL. Instead, it sets clear rules for whenever there is an armed conflict. These rules are laid down notably in the 1949 Geneva Conventions, their additional protocols and customary IHL for international and non-international armed conflicts. They regulate matters ranging from the treatment of the wounded to the prohibition of attacks against civilian populations. IHL applies to all parties to an armed conflict, irrespective of the reasons for fighting, irrespective of who might be considered to be entitled to use force, and irrespective of lawfulness or unlawfulness under the use ad bellum. So, the difference between these two terms should be clear. Use ad bellum the international law regulating the resort to force by states. Use in bello. IHL, a pragmatic set of rules that states have developed and agreed to for governing behavior in all armed conflicts. As long as armed conflicts take place, IHL is there to uphold the fundamental tenets of humanity, even in the midst of fighting. These principles ensure that the conflicts are ended in, in a just and human manner, respecting civilian lives and minimizing destruction. The aftermath of war termination is as crucial as the termination itself. Conflict leaves scars that extend beyond the battlefield. Rehabilitation and reconciliation become imperative to heal wounds and build a stable future. As we conclude, guys, our exploration of war termination in international law, remember that the path to peace is not just a signature on paper. It is a complex journey that involves legal, ethical and humanitarian considerations. Thank you so much guys for joining me today. If you found this video helpful and insightful, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Let us keep spreading knowledge and working towards a more peaceful world. Until next time, bye for now.